Chapter Six of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Six: A Capture. Kate Quarm had never felt a mother's love. She could not recall her mother, who had died when she was an infant. Her father, encumbered with a motherless babe, had handed the child over to his sister Sarah, a hard woman who resented the infliction upon her in addition to the cares and solicitudes of her house. From her aunt Kate received no love. Her uncle paid to her no attention, save when he was provoked to rebuke, by some noise made in childish play or some damage done in childish levity. Thus Kate had grown up to the verge of womanhood with all her affections buried in her bosom. That dark heart was like a cellar stored with flower bulbs and roots, they are not dead. They send forth bleached and sickly shoots, without vigor and incapable of bloom. Hers was a tender, craving nature, one that hungered for love, and as she received none, wherever she turned, to whomsoever she looked, she had become self-contained, reserved, and silent. Her aunt thought her sullen and obstinate. As already related, Mrs. Pepperrill had not been always childless. She had possessed a daughter, Wilmot, who had been the joy and pride of her heart. Wilmot had been a bright, merry girl, with fair hair and forget-me-not blue eyes, and cheeks in which the lily was commingled with the rose. Wilmot was a born coax and coquette. She cajoled her mother to give her what she desired, and she flattered her father into humoring her caprices. Naturally, the reserved, pale Kate was thrown into shadow by the forward, glowing Wilmot, and the parents daily contrasted their own child with that of the brother, and always to the disadvantage of the latter. Wilmot had a mischievous spirit, and delighted in teasing and tyrannizing over her cousin. Malevolent she was not, but inconsiderate. She was spoiled, and, as a spoiled child, capricious and domineering. She liked, in her fashion, loved, Kate, as she liked and loved a plaything that she might trifle with and knock about, not as a playfellow, to be considered and conciliated. Association with Wilmot hardly in any degree brightened the existence of Kate. It rather served to cloud it. Petty wrongs, continuous setting back, repeated slights, wounded and crushed a naturally expansive and susceptible nature. Kate hardly ventured to appeal to her father or to her aunt against her cousin, even when that cousin's treatment was most unjust and insupportable. The aunt naturally sided with her own child, and the father heedlessly laughed at Kate's troubles as undeserving of consideration. Then, suddenly, Wilmot was attacked by fever, which carried her off in three days. The mother was inconsolable. The light went out of her life with the extinction of the vital spark in the bosom of her child. The death of Wilmot was of no advantage to Kate. She was no longer, indeed, given over to the petty tyranny of her cousin, but she was left exposed to a hardened and embittered aunt, who resented on her the loss of her own child. Into the void heart of Zara, Kate had no chance of finding access that void was filled with discontent, verges, and acrimony. An unreasonable anger against the child who was not wanted and yet remained, in place of the child who was the apple of her eye and was taken from her, made itself felt in a thousand ways. Without being absolutely unkind to her, Zara was ungracious. She held Kate at arm's length, spoke to her in harsh and peremptory tones, looked at her with contracted pupils and with puckered brow. Filled with resentment against Providence, she made the child feel her disappointment and antagonism. The reserve, the lack of light-heartedness in the child told against her, and Zara little considered that this temperament was produced by her own ungenerous treatment. At the time of this story, Kate was of real service in the house. The Pepperells kept no domestic servant, they required none, having Kate, who was made to do whatever was necessary. Her aunt was an energetic and industrious woman, and Kate served under her direction. She assisted in the household washing, 
in the work of the garden, in the feeding of the poultry, in the kitchen, in all household work, and when folk came to eat cockles and drink tea, Kate was employed as waitress. For all this she got no wage, no thanks, no forbearance, no kind looks, certainly no kind words. The girl's heart was sealed up, unread, misunderstood by those with whom she was brought into contact. She had made no friends at school, had no comrades in the village, and her father inconsiderately accepted and applied to her a nickname given her at school by her teacher, a certain Mr. Solomon Puddlecombe, a nickname derived from the burden of the foolish folk song Kitty Alone. Now the girl lay in the bottom of the boat, under Pook's Exeter tailor-made clothes, shivering. What would her father think of her absence? Would he be anxious and waiting up for her? Would Aunt Sarah be angry and give her hard words? Her eyes peeped eagerly at the stars, into that great mystery above. They are turning, said she. What are turning, asked Pook. Ain't you asleep, as you ought to be? When I was waiting for you at the hard, I saw them beginning to twinkle. What did you see? Yonder, those stars. There are four making sort of a box, and then three more in a curve. That is the plow. Well, it is something like a plow. It is turning about in the sky. When I was waiting for the atmospheric, I saw it in one way, and now it is all turned about different. I dare say it is. But why does it turn about? When I've plowed to one end of a field, I turn the plow so as to run back. But this isn't a real plow. I know nothing about it, said Pook desperately. And, what is more, I won't stand questioning. This is a ferry boat, not a national school, and you are Kitty Quorm, not Mr. Puddlecombe. I haven't anything more of learning to go through the rest of my days, thankful to say. The night crept along, slow, chilly as a slug. The time seemed interminable. Benumbed by cold, Kate finally dozed without knowing that she was slipping out of consciousness. Sleep she did not. She was in a condition of uneasy terror, shivering with cold, cramped by her position, bruised by the ribs of the boat, with the smell of mud and new cloth in her nose, and with occasionally a brass button touching her cheek, and with its cold stabbing as with a needle. The wind, curling and whistling in the boat as it came over the side, bored into the marrow of the bones. The muscles became hard. The flesh turned to wax. Kate discovered that she had been unconscious only by the confusion of her intellect when Pook roused her by a touch and told her that the boat was afloat. She staggered to her knees, brushed the scattered hair out of her dazed eyes, rose to her feet, and seated herself on the bench. Her wits were as though curdled in her brains. They would not move. Every limb was stiff. Every nerve ached. Her teeth chattered. She felt sick and faint. Sleepily she looked around. No lights were twinkling from the windows on the banks. In every house candles had long ago been extinguished. All the world slept. The clouds overhead had been brushed away, and the lights of heaven looked down and were reflected in the water. The boat was, as it were, floating, between two heavens besprent with stars, the one above, the other below and across each was drawn the silvery nebulous Milky Way, the constellation of the Great Bear. The plow, as Pook called it, was greatly changed in position since Kate had commented on it. Cassiopeia's silver chair was planted in the great curve of the Milky Way. To the south, the hazy tangle of Bernice's hair was faintly reflected in the inflowing tide. Although the boat was lifted from the bank, yet it was by no means certain that Coombe Cellars could be reached for at least another half hour. The tide that had raced out seemed to return at a crawl. Nevertheless, it was expedient to restore circulation by the exercise of the arms. Kate assumed one oar, John the other, and began to row. She at first with difficulty, then with ease, as warmth returned and her blood resumed its flow. The swelling tide carried the boat up with it, and the oars were leisurely dipped, 
breaking the diamonds in the water into a thousand brilliance. As they approached the reach, where lay Coombe in Tynehead, John Pook said, There is a light burning in your house. They are all up, anxious, watching for you, and in trouble. On my word, will not my father be in a condition of fright and distress concerning me if he hears that I am out? I went off without saying anything to anybody. I intended to be back all right, in the evening by the atmospheric. But there's no telling. Father may have been asking after me. Then, as I didn't turn up at supper, he may have sent about making inquiries, and have heard at the cellars that I'd gone over the water, and given command to be met by the last train. Then they will be in a bad state of mind, Father and Sister Sue. Halloa, what is that light? It comes from our place. John Pook rested on his oar and turned. From behind an orchard a glow, as of fire, was shining. It had broken forth suddenly. The light streamed between the trees, sending fiery arrows shooting over the water. It rose in a halo over the tops of the trees. Kate, whatever can it be? That is our orchard. There is our rickyard behind. It can never be that our ricks are afire, or our house. The house is just beyond. The blaze is at our place. Pull hard. It's a chance if there is water enough to carry us ashore. Then, from above the belt of orchard, broke lambent flame and cast up tufts of ignited matter into the air to be caught and carried away by the strong wind. Now there lay a fiery path between the ferry boat and the shore. Pook seated himself. He was greatly agitated. Kate, it is our rickyard. That chap, Roger, has done it. The words had hardly escaped him before a boat shot passed, and his oar clashed with that of the rower in that boat. As it passed, John saw the face of the man who was rowing, kindled by the orange blaze from the shore. The recognition was instantaneous. Redmore, it is you! Then breathlessly, Kate, about! We must catch him! He has set our ricks ablaze! The boat was headed round, and the young arms bent at the oars, and the little vessel flew in pursuit. The man they were pursuing rowed clumsily, and with all his efforts made little way, so that speedily he was overtaken, and Jan ran the ferry boat against the other, struck the oar out of the hands of the rower, and flung himself upon the man and gripped him. Kate, hold the boats together. Then ensued a furious struggle. Both men were strong. The position in which both were was difficult. Jan Pook, half in one boat, half in the other, but Roger Redmore grasped at the seat in his boat while holding an oar in his right hand. The flaring wreck sent a yellow light over them. The boats reeled and clashed together, and clashing drifted together with the tide up the river, past Coombe Cellars. Pook, unable as he was to master his man, cast himself wholly into his adversary's boat. Redmore had let go the oar and now staggered to his feet. The men, wrestling, tossed in the rolling boat, fell, were up on their knees, and then down again in the bottom. "'Quick, Kate!' shouted Jan. "'I have him. Quick! The string of my parcel!' Kate handed him what he desired. In another moment Pook was upright. "'He is safe,' said he, panting. "'I have bound his wrists behind his back. Now, Kate!' The boats had run ashore, a little way above the cellars, drifted to the strand by the flowing tide. Kate, said Pook, jumping out, you hold that cord. Here, I have fastened it round the rowlock. He can't release himself. Hold him whilst I run for help. We will have him tried. He shall swing for this. Do you know that, Roger Redmore? What you have done is no joke. It will bring you to the gallows. End of chapter 6